Hello everyone, Cameron here again with another delightful episode of The Chirp, a podcast by Pigeon Loans, where we interview fascinating people with fascinating stories about their lives and relationships being affected by money and by loans. Today I have an awesome episode for you where I interview a talented freelance writer called Rachel Curry. I was introduced to her by my colleagues at Pigeon Loans as she writes some of the awesome articles uh, for their website and I would strongly recommend checking her out after this episode. One of the topics that she specializes in uh, is finance, which makes her a great guest for us, uh, not just because of her industry knowledge, but also how intricately she can explain how her own personal finance uh, has been affected in recent times. And Rachel came to us wanting to share her story about how government funding over the pandemic caused her quite a bit of hassle and also to share what she has learned from her experience. So Rachel brings her expertise, her storytelling and her financial wisdom to the chirp today. I hope you all enjoy and do stick around uh, to see how you can get in touch with Rachel after as well. Let's go. Brilliant. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on to The Chirp. How are things with you today, this morning? Great, Cameron. How are things with you? I'm very good. Very good. Thanks for asking. Um, I know you have a very long, awkward story that happened to you. But before we dive into that, can you tell our listeners uh, a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Rachel Curry. I'm a freelance content writer and journalist, and I also happen to write for the Pigeon Loans website. Hmm. Um, So I do find finance and investing, especially impact investing, very interesting. The story I have kind of relates to being a freelance writer and relying on a government program during the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. I know that's kind of relevant for all kinds of business owners as well. So hopefully I can uh, let people know that it wasn't always a comfortable process. And if that happened to them, they're not alone. Alone. I like the use of that word. Um, and tell me this. <laughs> kind of, intended. Yeah, absolutely. All the way. And what kind of made you or what has what has given you an interest uh, in kind of uh, personal finance and impact investing and what's prompted you to write about that? Where did that kind of begin that area of your life? Well, it started by being a freelance writer, um, and by January 2020, I realized, you know, business is a little slow right now, and I think that as I've progressed in my career, I've realized that's very common for the first month or so of the year. Uh, It takes a little bit, a little while for people to get their projects going, but at the time, I didn't, I didn't realize that. So I was a little bit stressed about my finances and I knew that I was making a different amount of money every month and I really wanted to feel a sense of control. So I started listening to a podcast called Bad With Money with Gabby Dunn, which is a really fun approach to money and just understanding the markets. And that got me interested. And from there, I just started researching and consuming different forms of media relating to it. And it was very empowering to learn about something that I, as a left-handed creative person, never thought I would be able to understand. So once I realized that I could figure it out, it it just kind of went from there. Fantastic. And do you think from all of your, you know, your, your studies and your research that you have definitely improved things? for you for yourself financially because I know as a as a freelancer you know that really hits home with me that every month can be quite a little bit different uh, in terms of what you're bringing in that's kind of the life of a freelancer in terms of the inconsistent income have you managed or are you on the journey to kind of even that out for yourself yeah so one thing I learned that was really helpful is to segment my money so before I maybe had one account for everything and When I was starting my business, I didn't even have a separate business checking account. So now I have, you know, an official LLC, a separate business checking account, a retirement fund that I'm investing in through my own strategy. I have a midterm savings fund that maybe I hope to access in like 10 years that has some investments in it. I have an emergency fund in case anything happens now that I can access. So I've got money kind of all over the place now, but... It makes me feel a little more comfortable just knowing if there's some money for anything really specific that could happen in my life. And it made me feel more comfortable, more in control. 
Fantastic. Well, this sounds sounds all very positive, um, but I do hear that you have uh, a bit of a less than positive story to share. And I'd love you to uh, tell me and the listeners as well, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, your listeners are primarily from the United States, but the Paycheck Protection Program loan in the U.S. Uh, came out toward the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. It was originally for small business owners with employees. And then over time, they opened it up to independent contractors such as myself. At the time, I did not have an LLC. So I was just a solopreneur, as they say. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I was reading about it through some of my research, uh, writing for my clients, actually. And I realized I was eligible for this. Um, but I wanted to be certain, so I did speak with an accountant who helped me, you know, gather all the information I needed for the application. And I know that we heard this word a lot during the pandemic, unprecedented, but I feel like it's really relevant here because the Paycheck Protection Program had never been done before. And it was new not just to people like me who were receiving it, it was also new to the lenders and the third party uh, fintech companies who are facilitating these loans to people. Basically, the Small Business Administration contracted all of this out to those companies and the SBI would come in later to forgive them. And just to ask, is this a loan that was given out much like other types of loans during COVID where you're, we're giving you this money, but we do expect it back in some form or another in the future? Or is this a, was this a simple handout? So most of the loans ended up being forgiven by the SBA. So basically I was given the loan. And then a few months later when the SBA opened up forgiveness, I was able to apply for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. They forgave it and that was that. I never had to pay it back. Um, some PPP loans weren't forgiven. Most of the time this is if they were used incorrectly. Um, there were terms for usage primarily for businesses with employees, uh, because one of the terms was you needed to use a majority of the money for payroll. When you're an independent contractor, you, <clears throat> the whole business is payroll. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of just give it to yourself and use it how you please. So it was a little bit different, but the expectation was for it to be forgiven. Um, it was a way to <clears throat> prop up the economy when things were closed down. Mm -hmm. So basically, I started freelance writing in 2019, and I did go to college for professional writing and journalism, and I had even worked in some staff roles after college for a little while before progressing into the freelance space. When I did go freelance in 2019, I was traveling throughout Southeast Asia, so Lovely. I had some money saved up, expecting that I wouldn't be making that much, and the cost of living was low in Thailand and the surrounding areas that I was. So it was a good opportunity for me to get my feet wet. Um, but honestly, in 2019, my income was like $8,000 for the year. So it wasn't much, but by the time 20, the end of 2020 rolled around, I had made closer to $50,000. Um, and that number only continued to increase from there. But at the start of the pandemic, things were still, you know, in the early stages, started what, like March 2020. Mm. So I didn't feel qu fully comfortable with my business yet. And I felt, you know, this opportunity for a PPP loan is available to me. Um, I don't see why I shouldn't take advantage of it. Of course. So the way the PPP loan worked for independent contractors, I'm not super sure if it's the same for small businesses, but in my case, there were two rounds of loans that you may be eligible for. So the first round of PPP loans, you could, you had to be in business on or before February 2020 to be eligible. And it ended up being about 20% of your revenue for either 2019 or 2020. So by the time I was applying for the PPP loan in 2021, I knew my 2020 revenue was a little bit more and that I barely made anything in 2019. Mm -hmm. So I decided, okay, I'll select the 
2020 revenue so that way I can just get a little extra padding. It ended up giving me about $10,600, which was super helpful. I was able to pay myself, contribute to my retirement savings. I bought a new computer monitor. The one I was using was crap from Small. Miami Down. Yeah. And really not even connecting properly. Yeah. Um, I was able to get an office chair for myself. I have back problems. So, you know, different things like that. Um, and I invested into my business in various other ways. So it was super helpful. And then I knew that the second round of PPP loans I was not eligible for because that required you to make less money in 2020 than in 2019, assuming the pandemic hit your business. In my case, I made almost no money in 2019. So even though I made more money, you know, it's, it wasn't this incredible amount. Um, so yeah, so I just took the first round happily. I knew I wasn't eligible for round two. And so that was that. I did choose to get a loan through a third party financer. It was deposited into my bank. I'm not sure I feel comfortable saying the name of the bank just because no it was a contentious few months with them. But I'm comfortable saying that they are in the top 10 largest U.S. banks. Okay, so and just to just to clarify, sorry. So you got this approved, this uh, is it this this PPP loan, but then the third party is the one actually giving you the sum. This Correct. bank, yeah, cool. And later on, the process requires you to apply for forgiveness through the Small Business Administration or SBA, mm -hmm. and if it's an approved lender. Um, who was allowed to be doing the PPP loan process, and it usually went smoothly. And in my case, that's what happened. I had the $10,600 in my account. I later on applied to have it forgiven. It was, and prior to having it forgiven, I had used it in the appropriate ways under the rules, which was literally just to pay myself because I'm a one-woman show. So you're not showing so, receipts or anything, are you, for your... No, but I did or... I did keep track of everything mm -hmm. just in case um, and showed how I used the money. But um, that wasn't really required in my case because independent contractors only had to use it all for payroll. And from there, you can kind of use it how you want. Of course. Cool. So by mid-2021, I had the loan forgiven, and I kind of just like wiped my hands of it. I was like, that was great. You know, it worked out well for me. And then the end of the year came. So I remember this day very clearly because it was Christmas Eve at 5 p.m., and I was on my way to New Jersey, driving on the Jersey Turnpike. Probably shouldn't have been checking my phone <laughs> at that time, but I saw a little notification come up from my email. And it was basically my bank stating my funds were frozen because of fraudulent activity. Naturally, you cannot call customer service at 5 p.m. Eastern Christmas Eve. On, on Christmas Eve. Yep. No one's going to answer. So I thought the timing was a little bit weird because then I was stressed for a couple of days before I could really do anything about it. But, you know, I enjoyed my time anyway with family. Um, my boyfriend and I were kind of hopping back between New Jersey and Delaware, where our respective parents live. Mm -hmm. So it was already a busy holiday season. By the time Monday rolled around, which was the first day things were open after the Christmas holiday, I decided to call the customer service. And they basically informed me that I was being investigated for PPP loan fraud and that I would not be getting my money. <laughs> and at that time, that was my emergency savings account because I had gotten the PPP loan prior to segmenting my business finances. Mm -hmm. And I had already used the PPP loan money. So there was about $17,000 in that account that I had kept in there to pay for any extra taxes owed plus just emergency expenses. As a freelancer, I'm sure you've heard it's best to keep three to six months of living expenses or more. Um, just you never you know never what know happens. What's going to happen. Yep. Yep. So that was my emergency fund and I couldn't access it 
they informed me. I was looking for a way to do something now. I'm like, instead of waiting around, what can I do to speed up this investigation? So they said, you can send us your 2019 and 2020 tax returns. Naturally, I'm in a different state, hours away from where I live. And I know that I hadn't uh, transferred my latest tax return onto my computer. It was just in a folder at home in my closet. And I ended up driving the hours home that day (laughs) to scan my tax returns. Um, Fortunately, you know, I was a little freaked out. My boyfriend was a very calming presence at the time, which was great because it was snowing on the way home. The roads were riddled with accidents, and I was not the type of person who should be driving at that time. And yeah, it was a very hectic time. I got the tax returns in, just trying to speed up the process because I didn't do anything wrong. And for the following weeks and frankly months, it was just me calling them, wondering how things were going. I was able to get some money out because. I went to one of the few uh, branch locations, in-person branch locations for that bank in my area and ended up also being a few hours away. So that was another day trip. The person, the teller there had actually made a mistake and allowed me to withdraw some of it and they weren't supposed to do that. But obviously I'm like not going to question them. No, of course. (laughs) So I took that money and then at that point I was fighting for about $6,000, which is a large chunk of change um, for me and for most people in America and the world, I think. So it makes a big difference, especially when you are expecting to have that money available as cash. Rachel, what, um, like, what, what was their, what was their reasoning, I suppose, for, for withholding the money? They say it was fraud, but what was, what was the kind of the nitty gritty about that fraud? They say that your 2019 was, you claimed that it was larger than it was, or could you just go into that a little bit more detail? Yeah. So according to the rules of the PPP loan that I followed, which I found through the SBA website, the official government website, you could use either 2019 or 2020 Mm -hmm. revenue to determine how much you were going to get. They had, because it was an unprecedented program, they were able to write their own rules and say, we're only accepting 2019 revenue. Um, And so, you know, I tried explaining to them, but that's not how it works. However, because they're a corporation, a publicly traded, but also, you know, privately held Mm -hmm. from the government, they were able to make up their own rule for that. And I think there was might have also been a little bit of confusion because I was, I did not have an LLC when I applied for and received the funding. And then about five months later, maybe I decided to form an LLC. So there was a change in business, but that didn't impact my eligibility for the program in any way because sole member LLCs are equally as eligible as independent contractors. Okay. So I think there was just, frankly, confusion about how the PPP loan program worked and also companies trying to make their own rules about it that impacted individuals. And I know that there have been studies that came out recently about problematic results of the PPP loan. For example, large corporations were getting millions of dollars and then there was a lot of fraud that ended up being caught, but a lot of it was legitimate. Um, You know, small business owners just trying to get the assistance that was offered to them. And so do you mind me asking how it, how it all ended? So as you say, this went on for a few months. Um, Is there a, is there a, is there sunshine at the end of the rainbow in this story? There is, but also I would say, I ended up more radicalized against (laughs) large institutions. So I did kind of burn out after a couple of months of trying to communicate with them. It wasn't good for my mental health. I needed to take a couple weeks off from trying to contact this bank (laughs) and going through the customer service loopholes. Um, So eventually, 
you know, I started contacting them again. Really nothing came of that. But then one day, like four months after I lost access to the money, I just happened to check my account and the freeze was removed. And the first thing I did was withdraw that money, transfer it to another bank. And when that went through, I realized they re they must have realized they were wrong in their understanding of the program. But to avoid some sort of lawsuit, we're not going to tell me that they were wrong or even inform me that the money was available to me. So I just figured that out on my own, took the money out and it all worked out in the end. But the entire time I was honestly gaslit by a large corporation that I felt unable to fight. Yeah, I felt it would be futile to try to litigate this company with $400 billion in assets under management as someone who is, you know, missing $6,000. So it was a really unfortunate circumstance. And fortunately, I was able to make my tax bill on time, but I would say barely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I did have to reconfigure my emergency funds and, you know, figure out new account situations. It was definitely a wrench in things for a few months there, but I'm just happy to be on the other side. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What is more attractive to you financially about, you know, being your own boss and, and, you know, looking after things yourself and taking responsibility in yourself, as opposed to maybe working for a, a corporation or another company uh, as a writer, what kind of appealed to you to, to go out as a freelancer? So freelancing for me has a lot of benefits. I would say it's financial mental, emotional, all those things. On the financial side, staff writer roles at in-house companies do not pay very well. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find one that, you know, would give you more than enough money. And I think with freelancing, you are able to give yourself raises on a regular basis by setting your own rates. rates yeah. You're able to select companies that are willing to pay you what you're worth. And when you work for projects that are paying you for what you are, the quality of those projects really shows because everybody's happy to be doing it. There's no resentment involved. Yeah. And I also am the type of person that as much as I like control, I kind of thrive in a bit of a chaotic environment. I did really well one semester when I took 18 credits, worked at the newspaper and worked 20 hours at a part-time job um, in college. And sometimes freelancing is like that, <laughs> yep. but I don't get bored and there's nothing worse than getting bored. So absolutely. And the, 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 and the future as well, you know, Will you be a freelancer for forever? Will you, you know, open your own or start your own company and hire other freelancers? Or how do you see, um, you know, not the immediate future, but kind of your, your future as a writer or a freelance writer financially, where do you think it'll take you? So I was surprised and happy last year to break the six figure mark. And so far this year, I'm on track to do that again. My goal this year wasn't to make more money. My goal was to make the same amount of money with less time. <laughs> and so far, that's kind of working. Um, I go through stints like right now is quite busy, but I have noticed I am working less in the evenings, which is really great. Um, spent more time kayaking this summer because I could take off for a little bit some afternoons. Um, I'm also setting goals that are more like getting my name out there so that way I don't have to work as hard marketing myself. Um, going to my first conference next month. So I feel like my goals aren't necessarily financial at this moment. In the long term, I would like to be able to, you know, support myself with a part-time writing hours and use the rest of the time to, you know, maybe write a book or just some sort of growth opportunity that I don't really have time for right now. Yeah, absolutely.
well, it's good to be busy anyway. And I suppose, Rachel, if people want to, you know, get in touch with you and hire your services or just learn more about you uh, or to hear your story again, what would be the best place uh, to, to get in touch with you and to find you? Sure. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is Rachel Curry. You can also find me on Twitter at Writings of Rach. And my website is writingsofrachel.com. So all the information you need is on there. Fantastic. Listen, Rachel, it was delightful to have you uh, on the chirp and to hear your story. And I'm glad that at the end of the day, uh, it all worked out for you. And, you know, nothing short of a learning experience, but it's great to hear your wisdom about how you're so on top of things with your money as a freelancer and how even though that horrible situation happened to you, you did uh, come out smiling under the side. So I appreciate you chatting to me today. Of course, we all have to adult somehow at some point. At some stage, <laughs> at some stage, yeah. Okay, well, best of luck, Rachel. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Cameron. Now, as a fellow freelancer, Rachel's story was a little bit uncomfortable for me, especially thinking about uh, when I started off, you know, every penny counts, and to get some assistance during the pandemic, only to have everything seized is a scary, scary thought indeed. Now, from the get-go, I realized Rachel was very, very good with her money. How she segmented her accounts, how responsible she was, and how she spent her PPP on her business costs. She's on the ball, no doubt about it. Something that definitely contributed to her meteoric rise to success. Her income after three years of being a freelancer is, is most impressive. But still, that can't help you when the banks decide to unlawfully freeze uh, your account. What can one person do when they are wrongfully accused by a financial institution? How does one person take on several? Uh, sometimes when that group doesn't even have a face, just an unreliable customer service phone line. Don't get me wrong, I believe that banks have their place and we've discussed this before on The Chirp, but in this instance with Rachel, I don't think that they were there for her. They weren't on her side. Rachel got screwed over and it took months to sort it out. How can anyone, after hearing that story, believe that their money is safe in the hands of a big bank? This is life-changing stuff that uh, that happened to Rachel. Uh, with no money available, money that you rely on, your mental health will suffer, your quality of life will decrease, and if necessary, you will have to ask for help. Now, thankfully, Rachel didn't have to at the end. Um, as someone who was so on the ball uh, with their finances, uh, she probably didn't need to. Um, but it's good to know that those options were there for her. If something bad does happen to your money, like a bank seizing all of it, uh, it's good to know in this day and age that asking for help financially is only one text message away. Now that's all for this week. Be sure to check out Rachel's website, Writings of Rachel, for all of her work where she writes about the environment and local stories as well as finance. I'll be back in two weeks with another episode of The Chirp. Hope everyone is loving their summer and I hope to see you all back here again next time. Take care.